All right, so um, here is the um, the notes, the supplemental notes on 2.3 that supplement your um, reading notes, your textbook reading, and um, the other podcasts in addition to the Pogles and other activities that we've done in class. So we're hitting it again and again and again, and I hope you, um, as the more, the more times you see it, the more familiar you are and the more you're starting to realize how you need to answer questions for IB to earn all the points that demonstrate your mastery of the knowledge. So, um, so let's go and get started. Um, so 2.3 is about uh, eukaryotic cells. Uh, 2.1 was cell theory and some other ideas and microscopes. Um, 2.2 is prokaryotes. 2.3 is eukaryotes. So um, eukaryote broken down, eu means again true, whereas karyote means nucleus. So things eukaryotic cells have true nuclei. Um, and they have what we call membrane-bound organelles as opposed to cell parts that we call in prokaryotes. Um, and um, here is a, a link that will help you practice um, identification of some of these organelles. Here's a drawing. Um, and you'll see some of that stuff on the other podcasts as well in the podcast series. Um, so eukaryotes are more complex. Um, and so we infer that they came later than prokaryotes. Um, Here's the symbiont theory, also known as the endosymbiotic theory. Um, and so uh, here's a link, a couple of um, resources here, but we've already talked about this in class, so I'm just providing you a little bit of extra resources as a reminder of what we talked about in class and what you should have in your notebook. Um, here is the electron micrograph of a liver cell. Obviously, it's not very detailed. Oh, well, it is very detailed, but it's hard to identify, especially if you don't see these all very often. Um, and have a lot of practice with this, um, what each of these components are. Um, and obviously if you look at, you know, these labels down here, well these there are more terms about more uh, parts of these cells than we've talked about. There's euchromatin, remember true chromatin and heterochromatin. Um, so there are some more complex ideas than we're going into. Um, but here is a drawing with labels. Again, you need to be able to draw and label as well as annotate the functions. Um, and so there are lots of ways that you can practice that, namely drawing, um, testing yourself, and making sure you can do this over and over and over again. Um, and so here would be a label drawing with annotations. Um, we've got labels, we've got drawings, and we've got annotations. Um, and I'm just going to move on because you have this all in Blackboard. So here's some more practice. Can you label the parts? Here are the answers. Um, and here's a comparison. So you're going to have to be able to compare prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And so here's a chart that we can fill out right now, memorize this, practice this, and you've got it. Um, so as far as, um, so you might want to pause it, see if you can fill in a chart like this. And if you can't, here are the answers. Prokaryotes are about 1 to 3 micrometers in diameter, where eukaryotes are 10 to 100 micrometers in diameter. So as you, as you can tell, looking just at those numbers, eukaryotes are much larger than prokaryotes. So this, these two drawings at the bottom are not to scale. Um, the DNA in prokaryotes are closed loop or circular DNA, sometimes referred to as a nucleoid, whereas in eukaryotes, they're in chromosomes. They look like those X-shaped things, but don't write X-shaped things. I'm just trying to get you to remember. It's a chromosome. Um, and that DNA is structured in a double helix in segments, um, distinct segments, those are the chromosomes. In prokaryotes, the DNA is found in the cytoplasm, in eukaryotes it's found within the nuclear membrane or inside the nucleus. For prokaryotes, we call the organelles cell parts because they're not membrane bound, whereas in eukaryotes they're membrane, ba membrane bound organelles. Ribosomes, remember we've talked about this and I just want to remind you of this. The ribosomes in prokaryotes are 70s, they're small, whereas eukaryotes are 80s and big. Um, prokaryotes don't have mitochondria, but eukaryotes do. But here's an interesting note, and this might help you on one of the hardest, well, sorry, not hardest, but one of the harder, more difficult IB questions that you may see. Um, that despite not having mitochondria, prokaryotes um, are related to eukaryotes. Remember the endosymbiotic theory. We think that the mitochondria and chloroplasts were their own living bacterial cell at one point. So when we look at the structure of a mitochondria, we see that there's a double phospholipid bilayer. There's the inner mitochondrial membrane and the outer mitochondrial membrane. Those are the two phospholipid bilayers. 
So when we think about one cell being engulfed by the membrane of another, that means that the inner mitochondrial membrane of the mitochondrion was the original plasma membrane of the bacterial cell. And remember that it's at the inner mitochondrial membrane that the electron transport chain happens. So you have to think back to cellular respiration. That's where most of the ATP molecules are made. Now, in order for the electron transport chain to happen, the Krebs cycle has to happen in the matrix. Well, the matrix is just the cytoplasma of the mitochondria, so that can still happen. In, so if we think about, can this happen in prokaryotes? Well, prokaryotes have that inner mitochondrial membrane. They just call, we call it their plasma membrane. They have a matrix. It's their cytoplasm. And glycolysis, the first step of cellular respiration, happens in the cytoplasm, which bacteria have. So in a way, we don't call it the mitochondria. We don't call these processes happening in the mitochondria, but prokaryotes can do cellular respiration, and it actually looks very similar to um, eukaryotic cells which is amazing when you think about the endosymbiotic theory and how that helps explain that data of similar efficiencies of cellular respiration. But the bottom line, prokaryotes don't have mitochondria, eukaryotes do. Okay, so that's the chart that you need to have memorized. Here are plants and animal cells. We've compared these over and over again, so I'm not going to harp on this. Um, you have this. It's pretty simple. Memorize it. Um, again, here's some electron micrographs. Now let's spend a couple of minutes talking about electron, uh, sorry, extracellular components. Let's break down the word extra means outside. I know you think of it meaning, oh, extra means more of. Well, extra actually means outside. Think of um, exo, exit, that means outside. Cellular means the cell. So these are things outside of the cell. Well, the plasma membrane is what defines the cell. The cell, plasma membrane also known as the cell membrane. It defines the cell. So anything on the outside of the cell membrane is part of the extracellular component. So plant cells have a cell wall on the outside. That's part of their extracellular components. But also, um, um, well, sorry, I'll talk about cell wall, and then we'll talk about the, the proteins and the carbs. Um, that cell wall allows, and we've talked about this, and you've seen this in the Pogol, that cell wall allows the cell to hold a certain structure. So Remember that this component inside the cell is the large central vacuole, and it stores water, mostly. Well, that cell, plant cell can hold lots and lots of water, and when it does, it puts a lot of pressure on the cell wall, which allows it to, um, to be turgid and have a lot of um, turgidity to it. So these plant leaves are standing straight. But when they don't have water, this central vacuole reduces inside, reduces the pressure, and those plants become flaccid or they um, wilt. Um, you've seen that. When you don't water a plant, they wilt. When you add water, it adds turgidity into the cell, um, specifically into the large central vacuole, applying pressure outward, kind of like a water balloon, pushing outward. Um, so cell wall is considered one of these components. The other thing that you need to know are called glycoproteins. Well, glyco, think of glycolysis, think of sugar. So glycoproteins are sugars on top of proteins. So we've got our cell membrane, we've got these um, integral proteins that go through the diameter of the cell membrane, or plasma membrane, and there are sugars on the end of it, carbs on the end of it. And these are used to um, allow one cell to stick to another, these two cells sticking together or identifying each other, um, transferring materials, and helps with immunity because your immune system has to be able to identify pathogenic cells. And these glycoproteins allow for that. If there weren't glycoproteins or extensions outside of the cell, outside of the plasma membrane, your immune system wouldn't work. Um, so they're, they're very important for that. Um, so I hope that you spend some time looking back at the immune system because this is a clear connection to that. Um, we're not talking about the kidney or the glomerulus, um, but which is essentially the filtration system through which your blood gets passed and urea or um, nitrate salts get pulled out of your blood and find their way through your kidneys into your bladder and out of your um, body as you get rid of them. And remember that nitrogen came from um, lots and lots of protein that your body ate in excess, actually. Excess protein that your body can't store 
and it needs to get rid of and it gets rid of through your urine which does tax your kidneys and can lead to other health problems but um, that being the case let's look at this other example of bone um, there are bone has few cells in it but most of it is extracellular calcium structures that allow for that rigidity in your bones when that when you lose calcium out of your bones that rigidity um, leaves and you um, have weak bones um, that can break easily um, and can't stand up to the pressure and weight of a typical human body. So we're gonna, I'm gonna stop there.